In the sport of MMA, it's not uncommon at all for fighters to want to be as intimidating and as scary as possible. And before you actually get to fight, one of the best ways to do this is with your words. Yeah, you can really stick it to your opponent, let them know the world of hurt they are in for. But listen, you really have to think about what you're saying, because in a war of words, things can backfire pretty quick. And if there's one thing you don't want to do, is make yourself look like a fool. Congratulations, you played yourself. And as always, before we get started, huge shout out to our Hall of Fame channel members for supporting us. I'm Bailey in from MMA On Point, and these are the 10 biggest MMA self owns. Number 10, Ronda Rousey, the time traveler. After announcing she'd be moving into the world of pro wrestling, where armbars take twice as long and don't require a trip to the hospital, the former UFC champion went on the ESPN show Golic and Wingo to discuss her new contract with the WWE. Now, one of the reasons Ronda has lost some popularity over the years is the way she's handled media. I mean, after the home loss, she didn't even handle it. She just didn't do it. Either way, the reporter asked her a pretty innocent question, making the statement that Ronda wasn't going to be fighting in MMA anymore. And she seemed kind of offended and simply said, I never said that. So, wanting to backtrack a little, he instead asked if there was a possibility she'd fight again and that she might, as he put it, go back in time. Well, instead of acknowledging this as a different way of phrasing the question, Ronda decided to try and shame the reporter by taking it quite literally. There's a possibility that I could go back in time? That's your question to me? No, Ronda, he didn't actually think you owned a DeLorean capable of returning to 2015. I do not have the ability to go back in time, no. And instead of embarrassing the reporter, she kind of only showed she couldn't understand a basic question, or what commas are, I guess. Number nine, Conor McGregor takes off his shades. Sunglasses are cool, right? Corey Hart certainly thought so, but some people find them pretty annoying, especially when you wear them inside. I mean, aside from the fact you can't see properly, and you can ask Tony Ferguson what that's like. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Stop. <laughs> They're also kind of pointless, aren't they? You know what, let's just be straight up honest, I can't see shit. But I guess they also hide your eyes, and if you're engaging in some trash talk or want to seem more emotionless, well, they work pretty well. Conor Riga has worn sunglasses at a ton of press conferences and delivered many stone-cold lines behind his hidden eyes. Me and Jesus are cool. <laughs> I'm cool with all the gods. Gods recognize gods. But when on stage with Eddie Alvarez, he wasn't having any of it. And about halfway through the press conference, he'd had enough. Take them Ed stupid ass glasses off. Okay, first off, might be the most Philadelphia thing I've ever heard anyone say ever. But Connor's not just gonna do what Eddie wants. In fact, he asked him, Make me. Make me. Also love how someone takes the monster energy away from him as if they could sense he was about to catapult it towards Eddie. Thing is though, while Connor is being all scary and daring Eddie to make him do it, I think he just wanted to give Alvarez a proper good stare down and you know, lock eyes with him, mano a mano, so he just kind of took his glasses off anyway. Which I'm not gonna lie, made him look a bit silly, didn't it? Thank you, you took him off. Number eight, Ken Shamrock and the Walking Dead. One of the all-time great original UFC feuds was between the Huntington Beach bad boy Tito Ortiz and the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. I think people probably would have been more inclined to believe him, however, if he didn't keep banging on about it and sticking his finger in the face of anyone who didn't believe him. Was it pride, intimidation, or just steroids? Either way, Ken Shamrock would turn redder than the UFC logo and do his best to petrify his opponent. A perfect example of this was at the UFC 40 pre-fight press conference where he told everyone in attendance that Tito was about to find out what he was all all about. So if I was you, I hope to God you come ready, because if you don't, I am going to beat you into the living death. First of all, living death. I mean, that can't be that bad. Does he mean like a zombie or like vampires? Either way, Tito's reaction said what we were all thinking. Ken had tried his best to scare the pants off everyone in attendance, including the Huntington Beach bad boy, but instead, well, he only made himself look a bit silly, really. I mean, come on, Ken, this is a sport. You're not killing anybody, are you? Number seven, Kamaru Usman, all night long. I wouldn't say Kamara Usman is bad at trash talk. He kind of has this slight John Jones vibe where he just explains what he's going to do to opponents. And because he was so dominant and what he said was generally true, it was kind of scary anyway. I mean, there's been some instances where he's straight up copied Conor McGregor. They can all get it. I don't care. They can all get it. They need to show me some activity, you know? Show me some, show me something. But when he and Tyron Woodley were going back and forth at the 235 press conference, what was supposed to be intimidating just came out as damn right hilarious. I am backing up. You hit me, I'm still coming. 
And I'm coming oh. all night long, T-Wood. Please don't right. back up. Even John Jones knew he was reaching with that one. And up at the top, Cody and Robbie had a good old laugh along at the back and forth that continued with both of them, which only kind of escalated in its own very weird way. And I promise you, if you come at less than 100%... Mike, second. Number six, Josh Koscheck's motorboat. Of all the killers at welterweight that George St. Pierre had to fight, there were many that tried to get under his skin, deep enough to make him retreat to the dark place inside his mind and plot sinister and evil ways of destroying their orbital bones by using his jab. Is that the best you could come up with, GSP? Okay, either way, what pushed him that far, though, was the 11th season of The Ultimate Fighter, where George and Josh Koscheck had to compete against each other in the tough house for eight weeks of training. Josh used every opportunity he could to get under GSP's skin, and although George was playing some mind games of his own and using strategy, Josh still beat him at the coach's challenge, tried to beat up his nurse, Brad Tate, and even in episode 9, George admitted it was actually getting to him mentally. Josh, I think, at one point got a bit overexcited, though, when he was thinking about what a victory over Team GSP would feel like and described how he'd rub it in his face if they won. You know, getting George's face and blah, motorboat his ass. <laughs> okay, so either he didn't know what that actually means or uh well josh we can all celebrate in our own ways okay but make sure you get permission first you wrote a boat and son of a bitch you old sailor you where is she she's still in the house what is wrong with you number five Cruz versus cody Absolutely loved the back and forth between these two in the lead up to their title fight. Dom had just won his belt back from TJ and had taken him to school in the trash talk department. You might want to show that diploma next time you're at an interview with me so you look a little smarter because you don't <laughs> talk smart. Then rematched and beat Cody's dad Uriah Faber who gave his blessing for the guy with no love to have his crack at Lord Dominic. The entire build-up, it looked like Cody was getting progressively more and more angry with having to deal with Cruz and his university professor-like trash talk, choosing instead to berate and belittle him instead of, you know, threatening to end his life or something. I mean, Cody almost ran next door during an interview to fight him at one point. But to me, nothing was more hilarious than the interview they shared on Fox Sports. It started off as a normal back-and-forth trash talk until Cody brought up Dom's busted-ass hands and Cruz had this to say. They'll be yeah. busted on your face. No, I it's hope so. Be fun. I'm going to eat everything you got. For a split second, you can see the realisation on Cody's face about what he's actually said. A little bit inappropriate for a Fox interview, wouldn't you say? Real freaking naughty. Number four, David Tamer's laundry service. I think it's fair to say the Ultimate Fighter season of Conor McGregor versus Uriah Faber got heated on a few different fronts, not just because of their rivalry, which was more jovial than anything, but because it was Europe versus the US, and some things seemed to get lost in translation. After Conor called out TJ for being an old snake in the grass, he proceeded, as he normally does, to tell them that they do nothing about it. But someone who was definitely prepared to, apparently, was Cody Garbrandt, who jumped up and gave Connor a little shove. The teams got in between them, and after Connor called him a twerp a few times, David Tamer decided to step in and drop the legendary line. Take care of your underwears. I'm gonna f you, man. What? It was a perfect statement to break the tension in the room as everyone just fell about laughing, really. David was trying to intimidate Cody, but what he said was far too ridiculous for anyone to take it seriously. Cody's face says it all, though. Kind of pissed, but also kind of concerned on a whole different level. Number three, Tito Ortiz's. The Huntington Beach bad boy has always been a bit cheesy. I mean, he had a pre-rehearsed celebration, he dyed his hair blonde, married a porn star, just standard gimmicks, really. Well, just to correct you, there was never no marriage. But you know, apart from that, there's been numerous times where Tito has tried to say something intimidating or tried to slag off his opponent, and all it's done, really, is just made him look like a bit of a sandwich. This guy can't even put a fucking sentence together, man. Are you kidding me right now? He's, he's, reaching, for, he's reaching for those grapes. He's trying to make his wine, and the wine's already sounding like a violin with that cheese and wine, um. This guy can't even put a fucking sentence together, man. Are you kidding me right now? And the back and forth at the Sun and Tito press conference was just ridiculous. Chell was dropping one-liners on Tito, and, I mean, he did try and throw him back. They don't call you the bad guy for nothing. A bad girl. At one point, he tried to insult him, but actually complimented him and then totally flummoxed the next line anyway. You call yourself a legend? What have you done legendary besides talk? Buddy, on Saturday night, those little blue eyes are going to be sparkling even more, man. I mean, I don't even know why he's trying to say that about his eyes, but, well, Tito certainly puts the effort in, doesn't he? He was face down, ass up, and it wasn't my girlfriend. Number two, Joseph Benavidez, high school flashbacks. Well, Henry Cejudo might be known as the king of cringe, but back in 2016, he was kind of only just getting started with his UFC run. He was still presenting 
presenting himself as the former Olympian and at 125 pounds, well, not many people talk trash, really. So while the season of the Ultimate Fighter made up of only champions from another promotion is kind of badass, the prospect of Joe Benavidez and Henry Cejudo coaching opposite each other was, well, a little boring, to be honest. But as the season wore on, their disdain for each other actually increased. They traded a few barbs back and forth, like when Henry pretended to be the Tyrannosaurus version of Joe B, and absolutely no one laughed at all. By the time of the final stare down, though, Joe had apparently had enough and wanted Henry to know what he thought of him and what he was going to do to him come fight night. So he explained it in the best way he possibly could. I used to guys cool. like you in high school. Oh, damn. Uh, well, I'm not even sure what to say about that one. Maybe he was trying to quote Roadhouse. <laughs> I used to fuck guys like you. I think the best bit is that in the background, Demetrius Johnson is just doubled over laughing. Either way, everyone just kind of laughed and Joe had to walk it off. Number one, Vandalay wants to fight Chuck. M maybe. For those of you that were around to witness this moment firsthand, I'm sure you already know why this has made it to number one on the list. Look, it was 2007, so I certainly wasn't, but let me explain what actually happened. So from 2002 to 2005, two things were happening in MMA. Vandalay Silva was in pride defending the middleweight title, savagely beating anybody they put in the ring with him, and Chuck Liddell was in the UFC, putting bodies on ice. In 2003, Chuck was in the Pride Grand Prix, and everyone hoped the final would be these two fighting, but he never made it that far in the tournament. So the fight everyone wanted to see was pushed back, way back, until the UFC actually bought the promotion, and that's when Vandalay Silva finally entered the octagon to announce this. Because I want to fuck, I want to fight with Chuck. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be one of the biggest slip-ups of all time. Wanted to call him out in his own promotion, in front of the pay-per-view fans, after years of build-up and let everyone know he means business. And yeah, I get that English isn't his first language, but when they've literally given you the mic, all to yourself to make a call out dude you've got to nail that shit what? instead well Vandalay left a lot of people confused about what his intentions were with their light heavyweight champion well that was all pretty hilarious thank you very much for watching shout out to that man luke taylor okay i'm not going to own him today with some kind of insult because he did a good job on this video and i laughed a lot and i'm sure you did too Thanks, Luke. Follow him at call to me underscore. Bow chicka wow wow. Shout out to Ben Rosette for the music in the intro theme. As always, cheers, Ben. Check him out on Spotify at Ben Rosette if you want to hear more. Shout out to these people as well, our Hall of Fame members. If you want to become one of them and also get a bunch of exclusive content like interviews, behind the scenes, chit chats and whatnot, well, go ahead and click the join button down below and become a channel member. Who made you cringe the hardest then? Go on, leave us a comment down below. Let's get a discussion going. Give us a like if you enjoyed the video and please do subscribe if you want to see more. I've been Balian. See you in the next one.